well, it's uh, it's three o'clock, um, and so uh, my name's uh, John Mann, and I wanted to thank everyone for tuning in to what is the third of our webinar series, Zoom with a View, which is being co-hosted by my office and the Anti-Semitism Policy Trust. And today, we're delighted to have with us Imam Kari Asim. Kari is not only the chair of the Anti-Muslim Hatred Working Group, but also has been appointed as the government's independent advisor to provide expert advice on a definition of Islamophobia to government. And we're grateful that he's given up his time today. And we'll be taking up the questions in the Q&A function uh, shortly. Um, but Carrie, if I could, before we do that, I thought it's probably important to look at some of the challenging questions, perhaps misconceptions relating to your, to your own role. And we've had questions about whether you're the government advisor on Islamophobia or on the definition of Islamophobia. And perhaps you could uh, clear things up for us. Uh, first, Lord Janman, I would like to thank you for inviting me to uh, this webinar. Uh, I'm grateful to your office as well as Anti-Semitism Policy Trust for hosting this webinar. I think it's really important that we uh, share thoughts uh, around anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim hatred, Islamophobia, uh, and uh, look forward to some discussion in the next hour or so. In terms of the query that you've raised, so um, since 2012-13, the, the government has set up uh, a cross-government anti-Muslim hatred working group. So you have some independent members uh, sitting on that group, as well as uh, you know, uh, representatives from cross-government offices. Uh, and I am uh, now the deputy chair of the anti-Muslim hatred working group and Akil Ahmed uh, is our chair who's also uh, one of the trustees of Nisa Nashim. Uh, and so from that perspective, I have been working on Islamophobia, anti-Muslim hatred uh, aspects for quite some time. Uh, in the, the appointment that took place in 2019, that was to define Islamophobia. And uh, effectively, what that means is that we need to have a working, robust, legally robust definition of Islamophobia that has broad consensus uh, of, of the Muslim community, but also the wider community. So in terms of this particular appointment is about defining Islamophobia and building on some of the definitions that have already been proposed and the number of definitions that have been proposed. Islamophobia is still a, a relatively new term which entered the public and political lexicon little more than two decades ago. A definition will cover prejudice, abuse, physical violence, discrimination and exclusion. So these are some of the things that I'm looking forward to working on. Uh, that's helpful to, to, to hear. I know from my own experience, as there is now a definition of anti-Semitism, as that is increasingly being adopted, it becomes much easier to start to get on with tackling anti-Semitism rather than arguing about what anti-Semitism is or isn't. And uh, I mean, how are you confident in completing this task? I think it's, it's a very complex web. Uh, as you said, John, uh, effective first, we need to have a definition. And why is the definition important? Uh, you know, because at the moment, some claim that Islamophobia just doesn't exist. It's just a fiction. You know, yet data on hate crimes against Muslims from the Met Police, as well as Talmama, among others, you know, renders such claims wholly unfounded. You know, we're seeing increase on a daily basis in attacks on Muslims, verbal attacks, as well as you know, physical attacks are taking place. Others, you know, so, so that's on one side. And others claim there just isn't enough Islamophobia to merit a definition. And the data, again, you know, counters our argument. So we need a workable 
definition that is neither too complex nor overly academic, you know, which maximizes its potential appeal to both public and political audiences and has broad consensus of the Muslim community and wider communities. So I'm very conscious that any proposed definition must not potentially impact on freedom of speech or existing legislation. To that end, I will be liaising with both freedom of speech experts and legal experts and producing you know, and, and procuring their valuable input into the report we prepared during the course of establishing a definition of Islamophobia. You know, I have also been emphasizing the point that any critique of Islam as religion must not uh, and, and does not undermine the definition of Islamophobia. So any critique of Islam as religion must not be covered by any proposed definition. The focus will be tackling hatred and not introducing any blasphemy law through the back door. We've been there as a country, you know, we, we, you know the, the, the church at that time said that we're not going to have a blasphemy law and that's very clear. So no definition of Islamophobia will uh, cover any form of uh, blasphemy law or, or introduce blasphemy law through the back door. And thirdly, I'm fully aware of the importance of having definition of Islamophobia that doesn't undermine the government's work, you know, counter uh, around counter terrorism policies nationally or globally, and does not affect our global standing as protectors of free speech and freedom of religion and belief. So the, the challenge is, is out there. And I'm confident that with the support of the various stakeholders, as well as the Muslim community and uh, other communities, and in particular, I'm very keen to learn the uh, and, and learn from the experiences of defining anti-Semitism, uh, which which uh, you know has established the boundaries that it does not curtail free speech but deals with hate speech. So I think that's a very important distinction that we need to make in terms of free speech and hate speech and how can I, as an as an, as advisor to defining Islamophobia, can learn from some of the experiences that the Jewish community had to go through when defining anti-Semitism. Um, that's really interesting. One of the things I think is, 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 is worth pointing out is that when Germany adopted the definition of anti-Semitism, the IRA definition, uh, what it led to was an opening out of German politicians and uh, activists on the left feeling, feeling far more able to, uh, to, to criticize Israeli policy than previously. Um, so rather than cut down I think we had an anonymous guest trying to ring in. Okay. I'm sure someone will deal with that. But a technical problem, someone trying to dial in. Um, but, but no, uh, Carrie, uh, what, what, what you found in yeah. Germany was that having a definition of anti-Semitism, not just did it not curtail free speech, on Israel and Israeli government policy, which was the argument that some had put. In fact, it did exactly the reverse. It allowed more criticism to take place because people felt confident in using a language and a narrative that wasn't racist, wasn't anti-Semitic, and allowed them to express a, a view more strongly than they had before. And so exactly the opposite happened there. And certainly, you will have our full support in your work because my experience, I see plenty of Islamophobia. I hear plenty of Islamophobia. I see and hear plenty of anti-Muslim hatred. And uh, you have a big job there and a big challenge. How can we work together? How can the Muslim community, the Jewish community, those who are trying to support this work, such as myself, how best can we work together? Yeah, 
Uh, thanks for asking that question, John. And you've been very supportive, you know, since the uh, appointment, you've reached out to me and we have had many conversations and I think uh, uh, we will carry on. Uh, obviously, due to COVID-19, we haven't been able to meet up in person in the last few uh, months, but it's really important that we do build on some of the work that's already happened and is happening, uh, whether it's to do with anti-Semitism or tackling other forms of xenophobia and hatred. Because ultimately, I think it's about having a more cohesive society in which hatred, bigotry, xenophobia is, is tackled with. And it's not just each of us fighting and having our own fights. Rather, if we, if we come together, then I think we have a much stronger uh, possibility of tackling hatred that that's uh, you know that that's rising its head in our country now britain is one of the most uh, tolerant countries in the world and this is we need to we need to maintain that so when we talk about islamophobia anti-semitism uh, you know it's, it's really important that there are there are uh, channels that are open in which we can share open Uh, from from each so you know, fights for a more tolerant and inclusive society free from anti-muslim hatred anti-semitism xenophobia and other forms of hatred is really important anti-semitism and islamophobia fit into different historical and political frames of references but what was common is that tackling hatred bigotry uh, whether we hear it online or on our dinner tables uh, or uh, otherwise uh, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia can be seen as comparable in some ways, and this comparison stems from the fact that they are both part of the same socio-psychological process of othering, alienating people, and that's where I think we are. You know, we have something in common, and we will continue to build on those relationships that we've already built on. Now we have a, a question here from um, from Jackie, who's who says that. There's been so much wonderful work organized by Jews and Muslims teaming up together. And yet this work gets very little publicity in the national press. What, why do you think that is? Do, would you agree with Jackie? And if so, why? Yeah, I think part, firstly, that there is, there is a lot of misconception out there as well that Jews and Muslims don't get on. We, we do have our differences, uh, but I think we have a lot more in common than that which divides us. Uh, and so from halal co to kosher to burials and recently we saw a good example of the Muslim community and the Jewish community the, the chief, from the, all the way from chief rabbi to the board of deputies working together to uh, ensure that cremation of bodies does not happen during COVID-19 or otherwise. And that was a very successful example of, you know, uh, politicians, political influence, religious influence, and grassroots working together. And I hope that's one of many to come. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, as you say, that this doesn't really uh, hit the headlines because I think when uh, people are more interested in divisions and hatred, and that makes the news rather than, uh, rather than actually something that's positive. Now that, that leads me to talk about something that you, sometimes you also hear misconceptions about or stereotypes about particular communities. So sometimes you hear actually, if you don't mind me saying, you know, like, oh, oh the Jewish community controls the media. You know? and, then, and then you would think, well, I've struggled with a, sometimes with a prominent religious leader to get a letter published and printed in a, in a newspaper. You know, so I can, I can talk from my own personal uh, experience and there's so many other you know, experiences but just as this fact that you're saying that it doesn't make the headlines that in itself goes to show that actually that myth needs to be debunked and you know there's so many other stereotypical myths that we need to uh, tackle with and that we need to tackle and i think it's through education through interaction through uh, having shared experiences that some of those myths can be debunked well, the government's made various announcements about um, the ability to have religious obs observance in places of worship uh, from from next week onwards. Are there any particular concerns uh, that you have for the Muslim community specifically coming out of the lockdown? 
the government's latest announcement to reopen places of worship, uh, you know, this uh, at this weekend, uh, I think does not accommodate uh, some of the religious practices of the Muslim faith, and if I'm right in saying of the Jewish faith as well. Uh, we are more used to having communal prayers, whereas this latest announcement only allows individual private prayers. And I welcome the announcement. I think it's the, it's the right step uh, in reopening our spaces, uh, and I hope in the, in the very near future, uh, both in our communities in particular, I'm talking about from the Muslim perspective, that we are allowed to reopen our places of worship, albeit you know, from, you know, with, with all the government guidelines and we should be able to hold small scale communal prayers. And it's really important uh, uh, that we are able to worship you know, in our place of worship, you know, ensuring that this does not impact on, uh, on the um, infection arising from coronavirus. And I, I've, uh, I've been advising government um, to be wary and prepared for an increase in anti-Semitism as people start to share more and more conspiracy theories, particularly on the internet, about the coronavirus. Um, now, it's been slow when it comes to anti-Semitism, I'm pleased to say, but there's definitely been signs there. Um, but there's been an awful lot of uh, conspiracy theory or anti-Bill Gates, vaccinations, um, about 5G masks, have you noted any particular aspects or rise in Islamophobia because of the crisis and because of new conspiracy theories or old ones being reformulated? Uh, absolutely. So uh, no, I, 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 for one, generally thought that during this national emergency and a global no, uh, global virus, a deadly virus pandemic that the the people who spread hatred and division, they will take a break. But unfortunately, that hasn't happened. Um, uh, Anti-Muslim Hatred Working Group, the independent members, have actually uh, published a report, and that can be the founder online, uh, showcasing how during even this lockdown on social media, Islamophobic uh, remarks and anti-Muslim hatred, uh, uh, anti hatred has been um, you know, spreading uh, by, by, and has been, uh, um, spread by some people uh, and then the uh, facts and figures are there but just to give you a few examples um, in terms of so it, in Leeds even though the mosque, mosque had closed even before the government's announcement there were some elements of the far right spreading rumors on social media to say that um, you know, mosques are open and they were they were using old footage and you know making that go viral on social media again you know Situations like these, incidents like these, you know, that they embed in people's minds that actually Muslims are not following the lockdown. Then we saw some commentators say before the beginning of Ramadan that the COVID-19 cases are likely to rise because Muslims gather during during Ramadan, you know, have communal iftars, you know, um, breaking of the fast or night prayers. Uh, so things like that are actually, you know, very important that we, we make a note of these things that how unfounded fake news can lead to uh, division, hatred and stereotyping a uh, faith community. That, that, that's, that's helpful to, to get your perspective. I mean, there's going to be an internet um, harms bill put in front of Parliament. Um, we're told before the summer, so presumably in the next four or five weeks, have you given any thought to how you personally and the Muslim community more generally could influence uh, the, the, this bill um, in order to tackle some of the problems that have arisen and do arise on a daily basis from the internet? Yeah, absolutely. We'll be, we'll be um, inputting into that and, and making some suggestions. Uh, we've seen uh, no, on social media that how anti-Muslim hatred, uh, anti-Semitism anti is sometimes allowed to go unchecked. And, and I think social, uh, the, the service providers have to play a huge role, a much greater role in combating some of that. You know, ensuring that free speech is allowed and people enjoy 
uh, people are able to enjoy the, the freedom that internet provides, but at the same time, that the harm is not allowed to go unchecked. It's, it's really important. And we've seen the, um, the Black Lives Matter um, campaign uh, everywhere over mm. this country and, and obviously uh, across many parts of the, the world. I mean, what's your perspective on, on, on this? Yeah, racial discrimination is a global issue and has been ongoing for centuries. It's, it's, a, it's a problem that is sometimes ignored. You know, staying silent uh, has proven to be deadly. And in moments like these, we cannot just watch from the sidelines. I think we have to play our role. The, uh, you know, my condolences are to the family of George Floyd and all those who've been, who, who, who've, who've been killed. Uh, under police custody or otherwise due to uh, racial discrimination. Uh, but I think, I guess the question is, where do we go from here? How can we tackle uh, discrimination, uh, anti-black racism, uh, you know, systematic prejudice that might exist? And the first thing I think we can do is, 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 is listen to the pain and sufferings of black people. You know, we've seen how even during COVID-19, um, the, the facts have been out that COVID-19 disproportionately impacted uh, BAME communities. The black and black people were more, twice more likely to die from COVID-19. Same with the Asian community, ethnic minorities. And so, so I think that goes to show that there's a lot to be done. Now, there's some things that the, that the government can do, that the corporates can do, but there's also a lot that we as individuals can do. And the first thing I'll say that we, we, we need to listen. We need to listen to that pain and not be defensive. This is not about white versus black or white versus asian in my mind it's more about all of us versus the racist you know and and those racists some of them may be willfully racist others of them might be uh, because of their ignorance because of and how can we uh, how can we help people educate about the unconscious bias that exists in all of us some of us are better at, at managing that others of us perhaps uh, haven't given any thought to it and now this is a, a real time for all of us a high time for all of us to think about how racism can lead to to uh, people's lives being ruined and even deaths, but also the, uh, you know, this is about making sure that equal opportunities exist in our society, in our communities. We might, all of us may not get to reach an equal, equal playing field, but at least equal opportunities must exist for everyone. And you, you, you used the term BAME there, and Martin um, had already asked a question, um, uh, which is, and I quote Martin here, how come Jews seem to be excluded from this group? Is this not a form of anti-Semitism? Do you have a, a perspective on, um, it's a question that's been raised with me a few times in the last week. It's not been raised before. Um, mm. uh, do you have a view? Do you have a perspective on that? I think obviously that's term that's that's been that's been um, used uh, over over the dec over decades and we we continue to use but absolutely uh, in terms of personally I think that you know Jewish community should be included when we talk about uh, when we talk about the communities perhaps that's our uh, you know th that are we trying to cover in ethnic minorities now it's very difficult to define you know what 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 is encompassed in ethnic minorities this this i think this also this term being uh, has been questioned in other ways that sometimes you know black people are also saying that when you when you bring everyone together it perhaps loses a nuanced uh, a nuanced approach that needs to be taken to anti-black racism so all of this needs to be debated we need to deeply look into it. how can we be fair to all communities now I, I would agree with you on that and i'd agree with your your perspective we uh uh, we need to identify and differentiate ways in which racism manifests. Otherwise, mm -hmm. if we generalize and only generalize, then we're going to miss a lot. Um, Absolutely. And I, I think the Muslim community and the Jewish community will both be big losers and have mm -hmm. been sometimes in the past um, from that. And similarly, the black community has. Um, it, it, it becomes an easy excuse for institutions or decision makers so i'm absolutely with you um, on that claudio claudio asked the question it's going back to this question of definitions um obviously the ira definition has been adopted by councils for example 
um, she's questioning um, about, and she specifies the local authority councils adopting the definition without committing to any deeper measures to tackle anti-Semitism. Her question, if a definition has been agreed upon, what do you think the next step is? The next, next step, if once the definition is agreed upon, the next step would be actually to ensure that the policies in whether it be the public sector or the private sector uh, policies are introduced and implemented to ensure that the if, if we're talking about anti-Muslim hatred or Islamophobia, then that that does not take place so that we can differentiate between uh, when someone is discriminated at work let's say that they are for what reason they've discriminated is it is it because of their faith is it because of their color is it because of their background and and, and, they, and so that appropriately that can be dealt with that's one aspect in terms of how you know public sector corporate sector uh, can deal with it but also the other aspect once the definition is 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 established those who are uh, who are uh, uh, who spread hatred that they will know that there are actually consequences that they will be quite rightly called islamophobes or uh, you know those who are anti anti muslim uh, hatred spreaders that effectively we will, that will act as a deterrent because at the moment because of lack of definition people are able to do things which may or may not be uh, islamophobic at the moment and so it's it's really important that we do have a definition that's practical workable and has a broad consensus of communities now martin has a question i think it's for both of us it's how can we ensure that islamophobia and anti-semitism are tackled within our own communities um, and it's an issue that concerns me how can how can islamophobia be tackled within the jewish community um, without question the starting point for me is that if it's not challenged every time it occurs or appears to occur then it will deepen and it will spread that you have to challenge um, and it's not good enough if you're uh, in some other setting to, to, to leave things but there also needs to be education if there's no understanding of the Muslim community within sections of the Jewish community, then prejudice is much more likely to occur. And that prejudice may well be through ignorance as opposed to deliberate and uh, malicious, but it can end up having the same impact. I wondered how you felt in relation to tackling anti-Semitism within the Muslim community specifically. Absolutely, I think I think there are three ways of looking at it, or three aspects. One is the um, people people might have anti-Jewish sentiments or uh, maybe anti-Semitic because of just simply uh, lack of awareness. You know, there might be uh, ignorance of the other, and as a result, people might say things, might do things that 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 will be deemed as anti-Semitic. So that 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 is in a way um, we can tackle that through education, as you say, John, uh, through raising awareness about the issue. The, the second is that the um, the stereotypes that we have in our communities uh, about the other again that that could be potentially because of ignorance but also partly you know, maybe willful deliberate uh, to 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 demonize a particular section of the community and that is you know, harder to deal with those in particular where it's deliberate where it's willful and also conflation I think sometimes of the political issues with the um with the hatred itself you know people might might we might have disagreement over some political issues but that again we we should be able to disagree and disagree well without demonizing a community without um spreading hatred towards a community so, um and so it's really important um, as i totally agree with you uh, john uh, in terms of this is about challenging uh, ensuring that we we challenge ask people whether you know where where is this coming from what's the basis of what they're saying and i think interaction between communities is really important some social action projects uh, and 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 the more people get to know each other i think the more they will realize that we have a lot more in common than that which divides us some people seem to have a uh 
a dislike of the term Islamophobia. Um, it's never something that has, has been an issue for me. It seems to me that I've always used the term in relation to anti-Muslim hatred. But some people seem to find uh, the word Islamophobia problematic as a, a, as a term. Do you, do you have a response to that? I think I can see where people are coming from. Uh, and it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a really uh, difficult issue and sensitive and also a nuanced approach is required. So Islamophobia is a term that's used you know, within the Muslim community. And therefore it's the Muslim community where, you know, which, which, uh, receives the, which is on the receiving end of the hatred. And as a result, we need to take their views on board. Those who do not like the term Islamophobia, I can see where they're coming from because they think that perhaps that will mean that we are trying to protect the religion. And um, I, you know, I said at the outset that this is not about a definition, will not be about protecting, uh, ensuring that critique of the religion does not take place. This is more about protecting people. Uh, so during the course of um, establishing the definition of Islamophobia, uh, we will look into that term, what term should be used. At the same time, when we say anti-Muslim prejudice or anti-Muslim hatred, I think people just think, well, that sometimes at the, the fact anti-Muslim uh, and hatred, that doesn't flow either. So all of that will be considered by the commission um, when we do uh, look at the definition of Islamophobia, but very clear on two things. When we talk about Islamophobia, this is not about curtailing the free speech or, uh, or protecting religion. This is more about protecting people from harm and hatred. Because, because Sally's asked almost that question, is criticism of Islam always Islamophobic? And is criticism of Judaism anti-Semitic? I'll let you uh, answer the second latter part of the question. But in terms of the first part of the question, I think we, we're very clear that the critique of the faith, Islam itself, has been ongoing since the, its, its, its inception. You know, and as a result, you know, no one is trying to curtail that. What a definition will ensure is that it will be clear to people when they are um, critiquing the religion that they will be able to do so without anyone saying that they're being Islamophobe. At the moment, because of the lack of clarity, people use terms loosely and it, it gives ammunition to those who, who, who say, well, Muslims don't want anyone to, you know, don't like uh, free speech because they uh, perhaps uh, claim sometimes that whoever is critiquing their religion, they're Islamophobe and vice versa. So it's, the clarity is required. And another point is very clear that critique of the faith itself will not be um, or will not be considered as Islam form. If someone wants to learn more about the Muslim community, um, you know, to educate themselves, um, where do they start? Is there a is there a good book, a good guide, a good resource? What what would your advice be? Um, my advice would be twofold. One is that there are lots of books about about Islam and Muslims, but I think it's more personal rapport, more personal interaction that will help people. So now there are lots of interfaith groups uh, and that's a good way of you know, getting to getting into, I guess, the communities because you will see people and, um, uh, who are organizing various things like, uh, and also uh, I guess there are some point moments when people can get involved. So for instance, there's a Nissan Shim project where Muslim women and Jewish women come together and they have their um, social action things and Mitzvah Day and Sadaqa Day. Uh, again, it, you know, um, things that we've done together, both communities. Then Board of Deputies recently uh, organized uh, an event to talk about uh, Ohiga Muslims, Ohiga community in China who are being perse persecuted. And so I think it's through those networks trying to um, get to know people because it's getting to know people is really important now now when we talk about muslim communities it's, it's muslim communities are very diverse you know so um because now british muslims come from all over the world and they will have their own cultural nuances but at least interacting with people will give you uh, will give anyone just a general understanding of the muslim community and then louise asks about educating 
young people about Islamophobia. Um, and, and perhaps I could just broaden that a little bit and say, well, um, or specify rather than broaden. If you take an area like the one where I live, where 99% of the population is white, then that interaction with the Muslim community, or indeed the Jewish community, is going to be pretty limited and pretty hard to organise. So how do we educate young people about Islamophobia? Uh, I think now, we, we uh, after lockdown, we are going to be looking at things doing online more. Uh, and um, so I will recommend some online uh, interaction projects uh, that now lots of uh, interfaith uh, networks are looking into. Um, but it's about even it's it's about even in our schools in our in our um, you know, in places where networks where we do things. So, for instance, uh, give you an example from Leeds. There, there's a specific uh, project that's happening in terms of cricket between you know Muslims and you know, uh, people of Jewish background. And when they're playing cricket, you know, it's a social action project. It's like completely. It doesn't really matter which faith you belong to. And this is how sometimes the barriers are broken and, and, and people get to know each other and realize, I think we and also we're seeing amongst young people, uh, there's perhaps less understanding of the prejudice. Uh, or, you know, it, they don't see as many differences as perhaps some of us adults see. Uh, that's the same, I guess, around uh, anti-black racism. We're learning that perhaps young people don't see that many differentiating factors as some of the, some of the not so young people see. I mean, you, you mentioned sport there, and uh, because you and I both come from, from Leeds and both know it very well. And we've had, uh, we've had a, a handful of very successful uh, Muslim, young Muslims, um, rise to prominence in cricket in the area. But I, I, we've seen no... Nobody really get that involved in football, and there appears from when I when I chaired the Football Association Task Force on Islamophobia and anti-Semitism in football, I was truly shocked at how crude and base the anti-Muslim discrimination and hatred in football was. Um, it, it was like stepping back in time to me. Um, mm. Uh, it, 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 it was unsubtle, it was crude. Do you see this as a problem, as a priority for trying to tackle uh, young Muslims, not just young, but particularly young Muslims, are yeah. very, very keen on sport from all my interactions. Is this an opportunity? And if so, how could we use it well? Yeah. Um Lord Man, you really, you know, have hit the nail on the head. I think so. We say in the north that, um, you know, football is a religion, and I've seen young Muslims miss some weddings because the football is on in the afternoon, and they really, uh, you know, want to watch their team uh, on TV, so or, or uh, attend um, the, the, the stadium. So, you know, it's something that really passionate about. But then we haven't seen any prominent uh, Muslim. Uh, go through the racks and play for the county or otherwise, you know, for, for the local club or otherwise. And, you know, there are some barriers. There are some, you know, perhaps, you know, embed systematic prejudices that exist and we need to work on. So that's one uh, aspect. The second aspect is that the, the, I guess, some of the hatred or uh, some of the discrimination that we see on playgrounds, as, and, and that's another aspect that needs to be tackled with who you know, um, is, is rampant in, in some places. And so I see that this is an opportunity for us to work with players, with the football clubs, to uh, say that when they say red card to racism, that this is also specifically about anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim hatred, so that we can root out some of these things. And, and I think that those players, those clubs, they have huge influence uh, on their on their fans, and there's a great way of tackling you know racism, uh, whether it be anti-black racism or anti-Semitism or anti-Muslim hatred in this way. I mean, I've I've always been uh, quite amazed, Carrie, at how in 
some parts of the country, sports such as cricket or football hasn't desperately tried to engage uh, Muslim communities. I mean, uh, in, in, in a city like Bradford, if you have a football club and you haven't got the Muslim community fully engaged, then you're losing the majority of your revenue, you're losing the majority of your potential future players. Um, I, I, I've, I've, I've raised that question with these clubs and there seems to be just blank faces there in, in, in dealing with it. Um, it's perhaps something we could uh, do some more work on because uh, everyone is losing out. Absolutely. How a question here of, of the diversity of the Muslim community. I mean, is it um, is it a different community in different parts of the country? Is are there huge differences uh, between London, um, between uh, Leeds? between places like Oldham and Bradford or Birmingham. But how, how, how much is their localised differences? Are they of significance and importance? Um, and, and in any work we do on anti-racism, is there anything that we should be bearing in mind from localism or regionalism? Yeah. I think... Um, uh, question has some deeper undertones in the sense that these are, they are not so firstly there are differences and those differences are not just in the muslim community i think that just generally we talk about north and south divide and um, so there, there are those things that we need to take into account as well uh, but without generalizing too much i i say the differences are with people's interactions so let's take the example of let's say um you know if, if we're saying in, in london that because there, there's already a lot of diversity uh, you know, in London, as a result, people will come across each other a lot more uh, than perhaps the, the, some of the places that you mentioned, whether it's Barcelona or whether it's the Oldham, you know, and, and, and because of that, people's, people's framework will be framed uh, as a result of their interactions. So we see in Manchester and uh, in Leeds, because of, the, um, because of the economy, and the opportunities that exist for people, the uh, relationships between communities, whether they be Muslims and the Jewish community or otherwise, are much more harmonious and much more cohesive than if you, if you go to some other places. And that's purely, I think, comes down to the, the, what the localized environment and how people have been brought up. And, and that, that's the same in terms of, you know, let's give you an example of Bradford. Um, like a, a school with a pr predominantly um, people from white background did want to have partnership with another school uh, which had a predominantly South Asian uh, people of South Asian heritage. And so those, those kind of divisions exist everywhere. The, the new style is slightly different. What are they, what's the example of best practice in dealing with anti-Muslim hatred with Islamophobia that you would highlight and that people could learn from and perhaps copy or do more of um, in their own way? I think if, if it's, it's realized, it's, it's seeing that ultimately that Muslims are just, you know, like human beings like us. So what we would not, whatever background I come from, whether it's, it's I'm a person of faith or of a person of no faith and I, I believe in something, I'm, you know, we can all relate to certain things and we all know deep down in our hearts that what's not acceptable. And so whatever we will not find acceptable for ourselves, for our friends, you know, whether they be of Muslim faith or not, then we should, we, should, we should challenge that. Now, challenge that in a way that obviously don't put yourself into harm, but effectively saying, do you really mean that? What are you saying? You know, why are you saying that? What's the, what's the basis behind it? And uh, also, one key aspect is that there are, there are forces out there who like to stereotype certain communities and they go from one community to another community. And we need to challenge those forces uh, whether it be at the moment from the far right or far left, or whatever they may be, or whoever they may be, we need to challenge those and challenge those robustly. Now we have a we have a question from um, from Eunice, uh, Eunice of Leeds. 
uh, um, uh, asking uh, why is your appointment voluntary and part-time and mine is full-time um, I should point out I the government doesn't pay me any, anything to do the uh, the rule um, but uh, it, are you getting proper support from government to do your rule and I would add are you getting proper support from the Muslim community to do your role? I think at the moment, because the, the, um, the work has not fully started and therefore I have not proactively reached out to the Muslim community. Uh, you know, the Muslim community is supportive. Muslim community does have questions in terms of saying that while there are some definitions already out there, so why are we, uh, looking into establishing the definition of Islamophobia and that requires bringing people on board, uh, helping people understand. So that's the, you know, the, the latter part of your question in terms of is there support from the Muslim community. So definitely the people I've spoken to and I have already uh, have had some roundtables uh, uh, with the assistance of anti-Muslim hatred um, working group independent members and we've held some of those sessions, workshops. Uh, as far as government is concerned, uh, the, the, the announcement uh, also said that a second advisor was to be appointed. And so the second advisor has not yet been appointed to define uh, Islamophobia. And so the work hasn't really started and therefore resources and uh, uh, terms of references have not been made public. So we should give government uh, a nudge then um, in, 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 in priority. Uh, to, to, to make sure that happens. Absolutely, I think it's, it's necessary because even even if you if you, you know if, if you've seen that even during COVID nineteen we've seen that they've been despite the fantastic you know examples uh, of the Muslim community you know reaching out to other communities some mosques turned their you know, places into malls others others mosques you know, um, you know voluntarily been helping out their local communities on a daily basis in terms of food parcels hygiene kits everything despite all of those fantastic examples we've still seen that there are some who are spreading anti-muslim hatred and so this is something that's that's impacting on our communities on a daily basis and this work needs to be prioritized no, well, I think we can uh, uh, we, we we can take that forward, and uh, I would say, I would say to to Eunice, I think there's a an element of certainly I'm based in London, um, and that has certain early advantages. Um, uh, so it's easier to get off the mark, I think, if you're based in London. Um, but this is not a, a race, and Carrie, I think. You have a better quality of life being based in Leeds full time, so you'd have one advantage there. But I would say the more we can be working, the more we can overcome the hurdles that are there. I totally agree with you, and and John, you've been you know in terms of really supportive throughout, and I think we have a lot more um, work to do together in tackling hatred. And you know, trying to break down some of those barriers and realizing that we have a common enemy out there, you know, that that's hatred in itself. And how can we together tackle hatred and, and uh, make our society more, you know, more kind I mean, and more I, I, peaceful? I, my suggestion is kind of question suggestion um, is that the, the more time I can spend with assistance of yourself and others in community and the more time you can spend in the Jewish community then the greater the dividends from that um, I don't know whether you would agree with that and that's whether something that uh, that we and others could attempt to uh, to foster further totally I think it's, it's like if, if there's less anti-semitism you know that will have less anti-Muslim hatred as well, and vice versa. You know, and so and 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 also, it's not a sign of a healthier society. No one likes to be called racist. No one likes to be called Islamophobe or uh, anti-Semite. And it's 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 educating people and working together to ensuring that you know whether the anti-Muslim hatred or anti-Semitism has not passed the dinner table test. You no, know, challenging people wherever we see in whatever shape or form we see. Are you looking to the future 
um, and the immediate future. I mean, we, we've seen the huge wave of anger we've already discussed um, with the Black Lives Matter uh, campaigning, um, the awful events in the United States. Um, we've seen this COVID crisis unprecedented in our lifetime, but we've not yet really got anywhere near the recession that is going to follow internationally, but also in this country. Um, we Brexit at the end of the year, which is obviously by definition a change, a big change in uh, our economic relations with the rest of the world. I mean, are you, are you confident? Are you fearful for the future? Optimistic? You mentioned some really important challenges. You know, we used to talk about Brexit being a huge divider, and then obviously COVID-19, then obviously now with the Black Lives, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. You know, all of these challenges have come our way. And in a way, sometimes, you know, tragedies have to take place, you know, like we've seen in the case of George Floyd. Uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, unexpected events need to come our way for us to wake up and realize uh, we are going to see, due to recession or Brexit, more division in our society. And as a result, I think each one of us has greater responsibility to, uh, to bring communities together, to you know, reach out to our neighbors, you know, whether they are of the same color skin, whether they have the same background as or share, uh, have the same uh, faith or not. In this country, we have shared values and it's bringing people together around those values. And one of those values being tolerance. Uh, if not, if we can't reach the acceptance level or respect level, then at least we can have red lines around what's, what's acceptable, not acceptable. Well, Carrie, I think that's a good place for us to conclude this discussion on a high point. And I hope those who are watching and listening in would agree with me that the, the platform that we've, this modest little platform that we've given you in kindly answer questions today demonstrates that you need to be given far more and far bigger platforms to outline your work, your priorities. If we can help in doing that, either by lobbying others or assisting in creating them, we would be delighted to do so. And it's in my vested interest in fulfilling my role. And I would suggest it's in the vested interest of the Jewish community and the health of the Jewish community in this country that we give you every possible assistance in your role. So can I thank you for giving of your time uh, this afternoon, for the clarity and honesty of your answers. And uh, this series of Zoom seminars will continue in two weeks' time with Lord Eric Pickles, the government's post-Holocaust envoy. Yet another West Yorkshire figure who's involved in these things. So. There must be something, I think, in the, uh, in the, the waters that we're drinking. Um, but Imam Kari Azim, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you in person when that's permissible in the near future. Thank you for everyone for watching and listening in. Um, and thank you for the quality of the contribution you've made today. Thank you, Lord John Mann, and also thank you to Anti-Semitism Policy Trust for bringing us together. Uh, I think uh, we've covered so much, you know, from uh, tackling uh, anti-Semitism to anti-Muslim hatred and uh, dealing with unconscious bias. I think these are some deep-rooted issues that we will carry on talking about. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye.